Hey everyone, this will be a video about shell scripting. Right off the bat, I'll say that this is a topic that can definitely be returned to in the future. There's a lot that can go into shell scripting, and surely some one-off video isn't going to do it justice. The best way I believe to learn any kind of programming is to find a problem you want to solve and do it with the language you want to get better at. Then when you run into roadblocks, you'll learn how to work around them and get more experienced as a whole. So I'd encourage doing that if you can. Shell scripts are still really fascinating, even if you aren't a pro with text manipulation tools like Ocker said, by the way. Anyways, what we'll first be doing is interpreting what the RHCSA exam objectives are asking from us. So that'll be the Create Simple Shell Script section. Now, I've had my eyes on these objectives for a while when I was preparing for the exam, and one thing I did was print out the objectives, and I noticed over time that some objectives disappeared and some were added. So there's one for basic shell scripting that I'll just mention here so you're aware of it, and that's Process Shell Command Exit Codes. So that used to be here, and now it's not but there's no reason why it shouldn't come back in the future. Okay, now I'll hop over to a little document I've prepared that goes through some useful interpretations I pulled out of the objectives. You'll see here on the originals that I highlighted all of the instances of it saying etc, just to point out that I thought it was a little vague. Now to expand on those etc's, here we are. Now, this is obviously not going to be an exhaustive list, but if you're able to understand some of these, then you're probably in a good position to tackle the kind of scripts they might ever need you to write. So, to power through these, we'll go through a short and sweet example of each of these things, and hopefully it'll help. So, let's jump right into the first one. Okay, so, quick FYI, I won't be typing up the scripts live, since if I try to type and talk, the video is going to be like an hour long. That's an exaggeration, but you get the idea. So, I've prepared some scripts to go through, which follow the points I made on that document. So the very first one will be a review about shebangs. So this will be pretty simple. As many of you are already aware, a shebang is nothing but a little line at the top of your script that tells the OS what kind of interpreter it should run in. So, the question I wanted to pose here is whether you should put bin sh at the top or bin bash as your shebang. And the answer is, it depends. Are you 100% sure that your script isn't reliant on any bash features and can just run on born shell? Well, if you aren't sure, then there's no shame in setting it to bash. It's always better to be clear about what type of interpreter is actually intended to run your script. So if POSIX compatibility was your goal, then obviously your priority would be to target born shell. And I mean, it's also fine to use bash features, aka bashisms, if you're explicitly writing a bash script. That's why the features exist. So I just wanted to bring that up since a lot of us, including me, have a habit of just writing bin sh at the top and then doing something bash dependent and getting confused when we try to run it on a different POSIX shell like a shell in BusyBox. So that'll be all. So we'll just exit out of that. Okay, so moving on, we'll talk about IO redirection. So this is pretty easy. We can use the greater than sign to redirect the output of commands. So I can just demo that here with ls. So we'll just copy this and head over here, just run that. And if we cat this file, we'll see the output of ls. So that's pretty simple. And um, if we want to look deeper into the details, you'll see here that we have three file descriptors. Standard in, which is 0, standard out, which is 1, and standard error, which is 2. So the next two are pretty straightforward examples of redirecting standard error, and I'll show that you could indeed put a 1 next to your greater than sign, and it would work the same as if you hadn't put a 1, meaning that, well, it'll work with standard out by default, just like we saw here. So the fun part is actually redirecting one file descriptor into another. So you can do that with the ampersand and the corresponding file descriptor number. So in here I show redirecting standard error to standard out. And obviously uh, we're going to expect that standard error from ls because the directory slash poop doesn't exist. <laughs> um, over here I have an example of writing a combined standard out and standard error into a file like this. Now I don't think you should memorize how to do this. Um, hopefully the explanation about file descriptors and ampersands makes it clear why this actually works the way it does. But just to recap, um, we're redirecting standard error into standard out, 
and then we're redirecting send it out into a file. So that's how it's actually working. Um, here is a simple example of piping, which is nothing but taking the standard output of one command and stuffing it into the standard in of another command. So in here, we're just running ls and then looking for any instances of the string my. So we can just run that, I guess, and we'll see that. Um, down here is a fun example of putting all of the above together into something useful. So we're using a debugging tool called strace, which prints the system calls of a program you run through it. And then we're running a ping command, and we're taking the output of strace, which goes to standard error by default, and redirecting it to standard out so that we can grep through this pipe, um, since piping will only take standard out. And what we're doing is grepping for the string ns switch. Um, um, and this is just cool because we're proving that the ping command consults ns switch for the order of domain resolution. Sort of a plug to my previous video where I explain all of that, so that's kind of cool. Um, and then we just put it into a file with a redirect called ping uses ns switch.txt. So we can just run this command, just like so, and we'll just cat it. And you can see here that one of the system calls is actually trying to open nsswitch.conf. So that proves that ping is actually consulting this file while it runs. Another cool example slash tip I wanted to drop in here was to show how to free up space with a redirect. So if you didn't know, when you delete a file that's open and being written to by another running program, then the disk space won't actually be freed up until that program exits. So a workaround to this is that you can simply redirect an echo of nothing into the file and this will clear it up and free the disk space without having to close the other program. So I just thought that was cool. Um, moving on. In this one, we'll be playing with grep. So grep, as you know, is a command that searches for patterns of strings in a file. So we'll need a file to work with and so I've decided that a decent example can come from the Internet Archives Open Library.org. Um, they have some big files here um, of various dumps. And I picked the smallest one, which is the ratings dump, and I downloaded it. So it's just right here. So going back to our terminal, you'll see here that I used Zcat to decompress it back into a regular text file. So that's pretty cool. And okay, um, we'll start with grep by just reviewing some regular expression characters. So the caret signifies the start of a line. This is called an anchor. Um, the star, as many of you know, matches any character. Um, square brackets with a range inside of them matches a range of characters or numbers. Um, if you don't put a dash in that range, then you can just match specific characters. Here's another anchor. The dollar sign anchors to the end of the line. And there are many more, but these are the ones that we'll just stick to for the sake of this example. Um, so before we even use any of the regular expressions, we can just do a basic search on our file. So we'll just head back here and run grip and search for the string 91 in our ratings file. And you'll see here that we got all of the instances of the string 91. So that's pretty easy. So we'll try something a little more useful. What you'll notice about the format of this file is that there's a column for dates and we'll be searching for a specific pattern of lines for certain types of dates using a regular expression. So we'll go back to our other terminal and to explain this first search with a dash E, um, we're pretty much looking for a pattern of dates where the year range is from 2020 to 2022, the month can match to anything, and the day must be the ninth. The second type of match that'll show up in this search is similar, except we're looking for dates between 2012 and 2019. The month can match to anything, just like before, and the day of the month should be the fourth. So let's just run this and see what happens. So 
So that's pretty cool. And as you can see, it's working as it should. We're getting the right dates where it's 2022 and the day is 09, but the month doesn't matter. So if we scroll up further, you'll see that the month can change, but the day and the year aren't changing. Um, we can put this into text so we can get a reversed output. And then we can see the pre-2020 dates because those will be at the top. And you can see here that these are matching to the day of the month as the fourth and the year being pretty 2020. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's try some other options. So grep-v will show everything you did not search for. So I like to think of the V as like an invert. So we'll go back to this command and we'll run it with a dash V. And this will show everything that does not match. So we won't be seeing any 09 as the date, um, and we definitely won't be seeing any 04 as the date either if we go back to the top of the file. Yeah, so like over here, you can't see that. Um, another option is dash I. So this is for case insensitivity. So I think of the I as insensitive. Um, grep is case sensitive by default, as many of you know. So we can just do a simple grep for books in our file and it matches nothing because we put books in all caps but if we use the dash i then we can still match it regardless of the case so that's pretty cool another option is dash c for showing the count of matching lines so we'll go up to our bigger command and we'll throw in a dash c and this is the number of lines that matched our search so that's quite a bit Dash O will only show the part of the line that matches our search, so that's pretty useful, especially if you want to filter out um, what you're looking at. So we'll do dash O, and we'll only see the date column. Um, that's because we were just searching for the pattern that matches the date. Um, moving on, dash N shows the line numbers that the match occurs on. So if we do that, We'll replace dash O with an N. We'll see here that these are the lines where the match occurs. So all of those are pretty useful. Um, the last three are all related as well. So dash C shows all of the surrounding lines to your match. So if I head back here and do a dash C and provide a number like two, like two, then we'll see the surrounding two lines to our to our match. Um, a similar thing you can do with dash A, which A is for after, it'll show the two lines after your match. So there we go. And dash B, as many of you might guess, is for before, so the two lines before the match. So I think those cover a pretty good amount of like basic rep usage. This will definitely come in handy for a lot of day-to-day -day stuff. So now we'll move on to the next script. Okay, so I think these videos are getting a little bit long. So what I'll actually be doing is splitting this up into multiple parts. So in the next few parts, we'll go over processing arguments, output, and all of this other stuff. Okay, so I hope this first part helped out. See you in the next one.